Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks to Azim and the whole COGEX crew for inviting me to speak today. I'm very happy to be here in London, this, uh, this hub of AI activity. Uh, so my name is Kazimir Wozinski. I lead advanced research in artificial intelligence at Intel. My team's job is to identify and incubate next generation AI technologies. So one of the challenges in this space is that real world AI systems aren't just chips or just math or just software alone. They need all of these pieces working together as a system. The key idea I'd like to leave you with today is that some of the most important innovations in this space are actually happening around the interactions between new hardware, new software engineering ideas, and new algorithms. So let's, uh, let's start with some key trends that are driving the technology. The first is that modern life is increasingly digital. Smartphones, broadband, and PCs keep creating huge economies of scale, making sensors cheaper, driving down the costs of memory and computation, and pushing more and more aspects of our daily life into streams of digital data. Now, of course, we all know this, but it's still arresting to contemplate the sheer scale of some of these things. For example, from now until the end of this sentence, there will be half a million new messages on Facebook and 40 million new emails. Hopefully not sent to me. This data explosion has led to the creation of one of the marvels of the modern world, the data center. Now, of course, data centers of some kind have been around for a long time, but these aren't your grandmother's data centers. They are qualitatively different in two ways. First of all, their size. A typical Facebook data center holds on the order of 200,000 servers and costs over a billion dollars to build. The second key difference is the volume of traffic inside them. Last year, the amount of traffic within data centers was five times the amount of traffic of the entire global internet. So these buildings are no longer just a place to warehouse a bunch of independent computers or storage. These are highly integrated, highly interconnected machines unto themselves. So getting back to AI, what are some of the key workloads that are running in this data center? Well, we've all heard of deep learning now and the, the qualities of deep learning that make it suitable for, uh, for working with massive data sets. You can learn features from data, you can discover hierarchical representations, et cetera. I'd like to focus a bit on the last two items on the list, the fact that deep learning models are highly expressive and how this helps their performance improve as you feed them more data. These two features together have pushed the field into developing ever bigger models. But before I get to the big models, though, I'd like to spend just one slide on small models, because these are an interesting and important trend to keep in mind, too. It's not as though deep learning is the only workload in town. A lot of computing revolves around applications like databases, where the essential operations are inserting and selecting records from a large collection. Databases typically solve this by building and maintaining an index of your data. It turns out that small neural networks can sometimes do a great job at learning the mapping between the contents of a data record and where it goes in the database. And this can take much less memory to store than the typical index. So an analogy would be how a library maintains its card catalog. A database would create the equivalent of a bunch of index cards for each book, adding cards every time the library buys a new book. On the other hand, a learned index would be a small neural network that's trained to map the title of a book to a Dewey Decimal number. And then you can just throw out the card catalog. So these small neural networks illustrate how machine learning is touching every aspect of computer science, even classic areas like searching and sorting. But let's get back to big models and the trend toward ever bigger models. I want to give you some intuition for why deep learning excels with big data. So let's suppose that we're training an image classifier to detect if a pedestrian is in the picture or not. So let's say we have a data set that has labeled examples of images with and without pedestrians, and we'll try to train two models, one that I'll call the simple model and a complex model. Now the beauty of deep learning models is that by adding layers, we can make them 
complex. So let's see what happens to a model's performance as we add more training data. The blue curve is how well our model fits the training data. The red curve is how well our model does with data it's never seen, the kind of the out of sample performance. For both models, the simple and the complex, you can see that as you add more training data, these training data start to become more and more representative of the whole world, and so the red and blue curves will converge to some error rate. But notice that for the complex model, this asymptotic error rate is lower than the simple one, typically. This difference in error rates could mean the difference between something that's a cool demo versus something you could actually deploy in the real world. But notice also that in order to outperform the simple model, the complex model needs at least a certain amount of data. So if you can see where the two red curves intersect, if you use less than this amount of data, the simpler model will actually do better because the more complex model will be overfitting the training set. So the short, the, the summary of this is that to get lower error rates, you need more complex models and it's only the more complex models that can fully exploit bigger data sets. So how do we handle the computations that are required to train and evaluate these bigger models? Well, here's one idea. We can optimize our software to fully utilize the chips that we already have. And that, that's something we've been doing at Intel. Another idea is we can try new architectures, new hardware architectures. So we're doing that at Intel, and we're going to hear about some really cool and interesting other approaches on this track today. Another idea is that we can split up our problem and run the pieces on multiple machines. And then finally, another idea is we can change the algorithm or the way that it's mapped onto the hardware. So in this talk, I'm going to advocate taking a systems approach and doing all of these at the same time in concert. So how do we do that? Well, here's what I hope is a useful framework for thinking about how to do this, called the roofline model, because it kind of looks like the roof of somebody's house. So for any algorithm, you can decompose its runtime into the time it spends computing and the time it spends moving data around. So it can be really useful to know this ratio of computing to data movement. This is a property of the algorithm. So you can look at how many numerical operations are needed on average for every byte of data. And this ratio is called the arithmetic intensity of a particular algorithm. The next thing we can do is for any system, we can plot what's called this roofline curve. So we have computing performance on the y-axis and arithmetic intensity on the x-axis. We can make a horizontal line that shows the maximum number of operations per second that the processor can do. Then we can draw a diagonal line that shows how fast you can move data onto the processor where a steeper slope means higher data rate. So this roof line represents the highest theoretical performance that you could achieve for different algorithms on this system. And you can see there's kind of a sweet spot where these two lines meet. This is the point where, for, this is the point where you're computing just as fast as you're loading the data. Those two rates are matched. But designing your system to be optimal for one algorithm will actually make it suboptimal for others. So the lesson here is that you, kinda, you need to co-design the algorithm, the compute, and the connectivity. So one knob you can turn for, for tuning the computation is to distribute your load across multiple devices. So these figures are from a recent review paper looking at over 200 influential papers in deep learning and, the, and what methods were they using for computing. So you can see there were some initial attempts in 2012 to use a large number of CPUs to overcome what were then the memory limitations of GPUs. And then GPUs increased their onboard memory, to, so then people moved towards using a small number of accelerators. And now you can see over time there's a trend for spreading walk, work across multiple CPUs and GPUs. So how do you, in practice, spread a deep learning algorithm across processors? As an example, let's look at the case where we're training a network using gradient descent. This is a very common workload. So you can either split up your model, or you can split up your data, or both. And when you split your model, you have to consider communication costs between parts of the model that need to talk to each other. 
when you split up your data and train different subsets of the data on different workers, now each worker machine needs to send and receive weight updates, and there could be hundreds of millions of weights. So you can see, I hope I've convinced you that, that communication is an integral part of, of AI workloads. The data centers have extremely complex and sophisticated communication networks inside them, which I've illustrated here. So there's several layers of switching inside a data center and very fast optical interconnections within a rack of servers and between racks. I mentioned earlier that at Intel, we're, we're building accelerators for deep learning to reduce the computation costs, and this is an important piece of the puzzle. But we're also taking a systems approach by attacking communication costs, too. At Intel, we have a group that I really enjoy talking to that, <clears throat> that makes silicon photonic circuits for optical networking products. Roughly speaking, they, they use roughly the same fabrication methods for building electronic circuits, but they build light circuits. One important piece of what they do is, is they're able to build integrated lasers right onto the wafer. So that eliminates a really tricky problem of having to use external lasers that mechanically couple onto the, onto the silicon substrate. So that means that you can have much higher levels of integration when you're building optical switches. And someday, you could even think about bringing light directly into or out of a deep learning accelerator itself. So we've talked about the importance of computation, communication, and algorithms when it comes to deep learning. I'd like to finish with a, just a quick case study to show what kind of advances are possible when these three components are optimized together as a system. So thanks to the setup of our, our previous speakers, now we all know the seminal work from DeepMind on deep reinforcement learning to play Atari games. So I think it's really instructive to see how the field has been able to improve the performance of those systems using these kind of system level co-design tricks. So I'll show you. So here's three different solutions to, uh, to uh, the kind of, this shows kind of the evolution of systems for, for solving these Atari games. On the left is the original work that, as it was published in Nature in 2015. So this uses a convolutional net to represent the Q function. Never mind what the Q function is, but the Q function. And it uses a single actor and learner to evaluate and train this function. The, the next innovation in the middle was to distribute this workload across multiple machines. So you have multiple actors and multiple learners. And this cut the training time down in half. This is this gorilla system. Then, only a year later, the original authors of DQN came up with something called A3C, which changes the reinforcement learning algorithm. And that enables moving everything onto a multi-core CPU, so that now the communication between the workers is using shared memory instead of a local network. So these changes altogether reduce the, the training time by another factor of four. And as a kind of a final flourish, here's an, a very recent paper out of Uber AI Labs where they managed to cut the training time down by another factor of six, again using a single desktop machine. So the main trick here is that instead of stochastic gradient descent for training, they use a very different optimization scheme for training called evolutionary search. So the rough idea here is that instead of, as in the case of gradient descent, instead of analytically computing the slope of the error surface around your current solution, and then moving in that direction. Instead of that, you evaluate a bunch of points randomly scattered around your current solution, pick the best one, and then update your solution to that point, and then repeat. So this, combined with some cleverness you know, using random seeds, this trick virtually eliminates the communication costs. This system also uses a very clever pipelining trick to run the Atari simulation part on multiple threads of a CPU while using the GPU at the same time to evaluate the Q function. So just stepping back a minute, so if we compare to the original 2015 system, over the course of only three years, by optimizing the algorithm and reorganizing the compute and the communication, the field was able to improve training on this task by nearly a factor of 50 in three years. So in conclusion, 
models are getting bigger, and yet small models are spreading. Let's not forget the small models. Bigger models are becoming increasingly distributed. Every algorithm has its own optimal configuration of compute and communication. And taken together, this suggests that systems level innovation across hardware substrate, algorithms, computation, communication, storage, and deployment, all this together can have a very large impact, possibly more than in any one piece alone. Thank you.